we've been looking at this new evolution of blockchain and crypto. And um, I think some of our, our internal um, um, thesis is on, on what's going on in this marketplace and why aren't the banks getting into it. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting to see some of that now come to fruition. Uh, you know, regulatory scrutiny was a big one. And obviously, you know, the banks have to operate in, and the institutions, large institutions have to operate in a, in a very um, clear regulatory framework environment. If anything, sometimes maybe a overtly regulated framework environment, um, as we've seen with Dodd-Frank and Mifid, et cetera, globally. So for you know crypto to come in, there was definitely a little bit of wait and see. You know, first of all, it has to be an investable asset. It has to provide some value from that perspective. So I think the initial stages were kind of this wait and see. Uh, but now, uh, you know, what we're finding the, with the clients that we're talking to is they just can't wait to see anymore. Their clients are calling them. They want to get in. You know, people in family offices or uh, folks in. Um, uh, private wealth clients um, and also you know prop traders uh, they, you know, they want to get into it and get in on this this uh, this action volatility is a is a bad word in in a lot of instances and I know in, in crypto circles and in blockchain circles uh, there's a lot of talk about bad how bad volatility is and um, and and the like and you know the prices of Bitcoin and that becomes a big focus but in reality, volatility is where institutions start to gravitate towards. That's where most of them will make, you know, make their money. We feel like right now is the, is the right time, which is why we've come to the market to do this. Now, in terms of the problems of that, that are facing these institutions, so, okay, great, they're convinced crypto is it, you know, it's not going anywhere, we want to be in this, we want to have the upside, we want to provide our clients this upside. Now, I think the issue is, um, you know, um, it's, it's all infrastructure. So for institutions to get into anything, they need the infrastructure that they are familiar with, you know, in the mold or in similar kind of uh, structures that they're used to operating under. A lot of these organizations are large, you know, hundreds and thousands of people with a lot of inbuilt systems and infrastructure in place. For them to add an, an asset class into that mix to support it, um, to, you know, support it from a compliance perspective, to provide to their customers, provide simple things like reports, valuation, custody, um, even best price, you know, customer. We've been asked, well, how does a customer ensure they get best price? Well, in a marketplace that has 200 odd exchanges and uh, the, uh, you know, a lot of people playing what we're calling jurisdictional arbitration at this point, right? If you are New York based, you can't onboard to some exchanges, but if you're in Oklahoma, you can. You might get a better price if you're in Oklahoma. That just seems, something seems odd about that equation. Uh, if you extend that out globally uh, and the global fragmentation, prices in exchanges in Japan versus Korea versus um, China versus the United States or, or um, Eastern Europe are drastically different. So these differences, um, uh, you know, are, they're there and people are trying to exploit it. But at the end of the day, from an institutional perspective, they need more clarity uh, and more, um, uh, uh, more ability to answer some of these questions for their customers who want to get into the space, but they want the, the assurances and the surety of the organization that they can provide them best prices, that they can um, securely uh, uh, you know, cost custody their assets, and also provide them the same types of services that they're used to when they're trading equities with them or futures or you know, any one of these asset classes.